Good evening, and welcome to Health Plus Weekly. I'm Dr. John Pakoa. I'm joined by our co-host, nurse practitioner, Hannah Raymond. And we are excited to welcome back to the studio tonight, uh, Joe Scott and Kathy Thornton. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Back. We, uh, we hope everyone tuning in uh, out there is enjoying the kind of transition to fall, although it's been pretty still warm days following what was, uh, we just were talking about the hottest August in record. Um, and um, we look forward to hearing where you're tuning in from tonight. We always like to hear where our viewers are watching from and try to see kind of the longest range and distance. Um, also, just please, you know, kind of pop us a note, let us know who's watching so we can say hi. It's, it's a bit more fun on the show if we can be interactive. Um, as always, um, we encourage your participation in the show tonight. Uh, Joe and Kathy are back tonight uh, on a follow-up from one of our most popular shows talking about concussions and preventing injuries in sports in the workplace, and so we'll be uh, talking about that tonight. So if you have questions regarding uh, concussions, athletic injuries, and how to prevent them, and, or any of the kind of stuff we're talking about, uh, please feel free to write in uh, via Facebook. Uh, as always, Hannah and I are happy to answer your general medical questions as well. If you have any of those, we'll hold those till the end if that's okay with our audience just so we can stay focused on Joe and Kathy and then uh, we'll get to those at the end of the show. Um, so Joe uh, and, and Kathy, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. For people who hadn't seen the show before, uh, Joe, you are the manager of occupational therapy and athletic trainer yourself. Occupational uh, health. Occupational yeah. health, I'm sorry. Yeah, occupational okay. health. And Kathy, team lead injury prevention and, ath and athletic training, correct? correct? Right, for South Coast for, for us. Coast. And your, yep. uh, your headquarters is at, is it at St. Luke's? Uh, actually, our office is at the 480 at the Brain and Spine Center. Brain and Spine yeah. Center, okay. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, so the last time we were here, we, we kind of focused more on workplace injuries and kind of ergonomics and preventing, you know, the aches and pains that can come from <laughs> sitting like I'm sitting right yes, now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and so we thought it would be great to have a follow-up kind of during fall sports season once that started um, to talk a little bit more about uh, concussions and sports injuries and also, as Dr. Bacow said, um, some heat-related injuries. So. Uh, you guys are both really involved with um, concussion management, prevention, education, kind of in the community. Could you describe a little bit about your background in concussions and also kind of where you are in terms of your role in, like the, in the community? So uh, I started uh, back, back in 2010 as a representative for the Athletic Trainers of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, I sat on a DPH uh, expert concussion panel that was actually looking at the regulations that were being drawn up at that time mm -hmm. um, for MIA member schools uh, related to the management of concussions um, in the schools. Um, and then soon after, probably about 2012 or 13, um, although Kathy was involved right along because right, I was right. always you guys consulting have always been with working her. To, yeah, working yeah. together for yeah. a long time. Uh, and, um, you know, then we, what, what happened from that is one of the things that they, decided was there had to be DPH approved concussion education for parents, for coaches, for athletes. Okay. So Kathy and I put together a program and, and sent it into the DPH uh, to get it approved. So we became providers of education in this local area. For okay. um, we both uh, continued to be members of that uh, uh, concussion expert panel, um, which we usually meet about twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, just to look at updates and, and regulations or new things that have come up. New data, um, new... Yeah, new yeah, information. Yeah. Um, information that has come back to the DPH about, you know, problems that they might have mm -hmm. uh, returning uh, student athletes to education. Oh, okay. um, and even expanded to the point where, okay, so why is a student athlete who gets a concussion any different from uh, a non-athlete who gets injured and has a concussion and needs to come back to schoolwork as well. Right. So how do we incorporate that and what do we do with things right. like that? So right. Outside of the sports people. world, athletic Absolutely. world. Okay, okay, good. And I, as Joe said, I sit on the clinical expert panel for DPH. I also sit on the Youth Sports Advisory Council for the DPH. Okay. For the last probably six or seven years now at this point, I have been lecturing around the state with DPH um, regarding concussions, mostly from Worcester, East. East. Okay. Wow. I also am a member of the Massachusetts Concussion Management Coalition, which is a nonprofit that is tasked with trying to promote concussion awareness and uh, improve concussion treatment. We just actually had a lecture at St. Luke's for our providers. Right. Yeah. At the McBratney, we had about 40 providers that attended, along with some paramedics and school nurses also, that went very, very well. So I do a lot of educating within the community. So you guys are true experts. <laughs> we, <laughs> I'm not sure um, about that. And, and then we work closely with uh, Dr. John Dorn, who's mm -hmm. a neuropsychologist. Right. Um, 
when we have those people that have post-concussive syndromes, they're not getting better right. um, and trying to facilitate follow-up um, with him so that he can do more extensive testing yes. and diagnostics and, and make better recommendations to the parents as well as to the schools about those children coming back to, uh, to the educational right. stuff. Right, right. And I think that's so important that you guys mentioned. I know we touched on it last time and we'll talk about it more, but not just returning to playing, but returning to learning is, you know, Which equally, probably more equally if not really. more important, right. you know, seeing as that's... And we work very closely. We have 10 athletic trainers, so South Coast provides the athletic trainers to 10 of the area high schools okay. that are out in the high schools every day dealing with the athletes and the injuries. So we also provide guidance to those athletic trainers when they need it wow. regarding concussions yeah. and things of that nature also. That's great. Great, great. So a big emphasis of, of the show um, has always been prevention. So for people listening tonight, parents, you know, athletes, loved ones of athletes and coaches and things, what are... Let's start with trying to prevent concussions. I'd love to tell you we can prevent them, <laughs> yeah. but I can't. Okay. Um, the key is minimizing the risk of them yeah. rather than the true prevention. Exactly. There's lots of things we can prevent. Concussions are one of those things that are going to happen. I mean, they happen, you know, the brothers fighting on the bed, they fall off the bed, <laughs> the mm -hmm. jungle gym, the car accident. Go-karts, the... perhaps. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, go that was myself, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go my yes. son, yes. yep, go-kart, yep. <laughs> but the key is to minimize that risk. So. To look at the things like make sure that, for example, with sports, they're using the correct technique, that the coaches know what they're doing when they're teaching these techniques. Mm -hmm. There are measures put in place in the high school settings now where they have to limit the contact in football how many days that they can have contact. They can still hit, they just mm -hmm. can't do it every day like they used to. Okay. Things of that nature tend to help. And the big key is treating them appropriately once they do occur. Okay. Yeah, I think early recognition. Yeah, so First maybe early diagnosis. Yep. Okay. Early yep. recognition, early diagnosis, and then putting into place those um, things that are going to help that person to rec recover as quickly as possible and not delay the symptoms and go into those post concussive um, you know, terms where sometimes it can last up to six weeks to six months to, you know, even years some of them have been documented yeah, exactly. for. Okay. So what happens when you get a concussion? You know, what happens in the brain? Well, concussions are a functional injury, mm -hmm. not a structural injury. Right. So the easiest way I explain to people is think about jello in a jar of water and you shake it back and forth. That's kind of what happens to the brain. Okay. So there are chem it's chemical changes and it's a cascade of chemicals that changes the way the brain works. What I tell most people is the signals are still getting there. It's akin to driving straight up 93 through Boston or going 495 to get right. to Boston. The thoughts still get there and they can still process. It just takes an awful lot longer and a lot more work to get there because of the difficulty in the uh, dysfunction or the functional dysfunction that occurs. And so that's one of the, the common things that we encounter in primary care is um, somebody with a, with a likely concussion asking for a CAT scan. And now there are certainly instances where, you know, with an open head injury and some kind of period of time with a loss of consciousness where it may be appropriate. But for the most part, do people who have a concussion need a CAT scan of their brains? A concussion, again, it's not so much the, the concussion, but it's the severity of the traumatic, traumatic brain injury that they suffer. Right. So if it was an incident where there was a skull fracture, mm -hmm. where there was bleeding, where, where potentially there were other uh, you know, very severe things going on, then yes, by all means, a CAT scan would probably right. be necessary. Um, but if you come in and you banged your head and you have a headache um, and you have some signs and symptoms, that's not always, not always you know, a sign. Yeah. As a matter of fact, in, in talking to Dr. Brian Sard, who's uh, from Boston Children's Hospital, works in the ED, you know, with children, they try and limit the exposure mm -hmm. to the cat scans, yeah. right? They want to do less and less of those. Mm -hmm. um, so there really has to be some severe signs and symptoms right. Right. that would uh, make somebody say, okay, you know, this is definitely something we want to do cat scan for. Because that, the actual concussion doesn't show on a cat scan, and that's kind of the hallmark of it. You know, it's the the um, sign the neurologic changes that come with the with the concussion without any structural changes on the imaging. Yeah, exactly. So I think that that's important for some people to right. To the hear again you can't take a picture yeah, of it. It's not a. Of it, it won't show up. It's based yeah. on how people right. feel. Like Kathy what said saying. the functional right. aspect of a concussion, um, you can't see that. Right. But you know you can see any type of physi physiological or physical changes due to the traumatic brain injury right. that may be also accompanied with a concussion. Um, or it may be a severe case all on its own. Right, right. Yeah, there's very specific algorithms now, especially for those under 18. Mm -hmm. I think they estimate about 2% of people who suffer a 
low velocity. So not car accident, not falling from a height that's higher than your, your height, mm -hmm. things of that nature. There, there's such a low risk of there being a bleed. So I think they say about 2% of that people in that low velocity cat category will need them. And there's specific things such as protracted vomiting, significant changes in mental status, yes, right. significantly worsening headache, not just that they have a headache or the headache gets worse because they went to a concert, right. but because it's just worsening their sitting still. Those are the things that would elevate it to we need to look for something right. different. So I explain to parents all the time, they're not looking for a concussion with CAT scan, they're ruling out the big bad something, stuff. Some, something more serious. The big bad and stuff. So, and that's yep. where the education and early education piece comes in, that if you recognize it early, those are the things that we can counsel people on. In primary care, you can counsel people on on the, on the sidelines and, and kind of through, the, through the, your um, people in the community about what to look for and when to worry. Um, so you exactly. just mentioned, you know, some really great things to, to think about, kind of vomiting that doesn't go away, um, you know, any skull fracture that you had said, um, and then, you know, the, the worsening headache kind of without a, a, good, a good reason. So those are all right. things really to worry about. Really bad loss of balance, visual disturbances that continue to get worse and worse right. and worse. Those okay. Confusion. Confusion. Confusion is another big one, but not yeah. just confusion for a short period of time. And the other one is loss of consciousness. Right. If they did lose consciousness, they're much more likely to do a CAT scan. Right, right. Yeah, and I think there's a time. I'm not sure exactly the algorithm, but uh, there's a time. Usually it's yeah. over, I think it's over a minute. Over a minute of loss yeah, of consciousness. Yeah, I think it's over a minute. But again, most concussions, only about 10% of concussions do children actually lose consciousness. Oh, okay. It's very uncommon. Okay. That's one of those myths. People think you need to lose consciousness sometimes to for concussion, concussion, but it's only about 10%. Gotcha. Okay. And sometimes the CAT scan is done secondary because they're worried about uh, cervical problems, cervical fractures, you know, mm -hmm. depending on what the impact of the injury is, what the actual mechanism was, um, if there's any type of neurological pins and needles, arms, legs, whatever, then they're saying, okay, now we need to do this to find out is there something going on cervically um, right. that, you know, may be masked by the signs and symptoms of the concussion. Right. So not just worrying about the head, but the neck too. Absolutely. Injuries. Okay. So when to worry for you know, the people who, you know, whether you're the person who suffered the injury, you're the parent, you're the loved one, you're the coach, you're the teacher, you know, you know and so there's a, there's a, you know, and we can talk about too, it's not just always a head collision. You can suffer a concussion without ever hitting your head. But for, let's just start about first like a collision where a head's involved and someone hits their head or they hit, you know, Afterwards, how do we know that it's just a bump on the head? You know what I mean. You're going to go about your day, or how do we, you know, you know, educate people about when to worry that there that you should have a high suspicion for a concussion may have occurred, um, and then what to do next and things like that. Any hard blow to the body that causes any type of a whiplash effect, that head whipping back and forth, or a blow to the head, should always be the child should always be checked out whether it be just the parent asking questions, you know, do you have symptoms? And that's what we're looking for. The tough part with that is they have to tell us sometimes they have symptoms if they're not obvious outward signs, mm -hmm. such as they're dizzy, stumbling. So we're looking for things like headache, dizziness, are they confused, are they lethargic, things of that nature. When you get up into the teen population, Sometimes they're a little more subtle. You might be looking, you know, maybe next day if they're having sleep disturbances. Mm -hmm. If they're normally a child who's fighting with you over something and all of a sudden they're docile and they're not fighting or there's someone who's on their computer playing video games or on their phone texting constantly and they don't want to do any of that. Those are some of the subtle signs that there may actually be an injury that they're not telling you about. They're telling you one thing and showing you something else. So yeah. you have to be a detective sometimes. Yeah, a colleague of mine, his son suffered a concussion over the summer and he was remarking how he was you know, um, like a teenager, and um, all of a sudden his son kind of reverted back, wanted to be like, you know, lay with him, became real affectionate, <laughs> like, Dad, I love you, you know what I mean, don't you know what I mean, and just it was really, right? Something's I mean, wrong here. Yeah, something, something it was really, there was a, a kind of a market change in behavior though, right? Absolutely. And those emotional changes you see in teens, you know, it's uh, a perfect hallmark you'll see sometimes is that, that boy who playing football hits someone and next thing you know you turn around they're sitting on the bench and there are tears running down their face and you ask them why they're crying and they look and they go i don't know no idea yeah. or they're they're telling you they got hit and they go i got hit and they're not normally a cry or things like that but they also do sometimes they just become a lot more emotional sometimes it's anxiety mm -hmm. sometimes it's like you were speaking about your colleagues yeah. and sometimes it's crying and that can last for, for a period yeah. of time too. So I, I see that pretty frequently as, you know, people will come in and say, why do I feel like this? I just don't feel yeah. like myself. I'm more anxious. I'm more, yeah. you know, emotional crying or my mood has just been off. And that's why it's important to kind of get that early diagnosis mm -hmm. and to help 
that person to manage that right from the start so that those symptoms don't last and don't they, they don't go on for on you know ever and ever um, and helping them to understand this is normal you know one of the things I think that, that you hear um, is you will get better mm -hmm. you concussions don't last forever mm -hmm. now you can have a traumatic brain injury and something severe can happen and that might you know last for a much longer period of time but concussions do get better and if you manage them correctly and you're smart about how you're dealing with them they tend to get better faster get better. so that's the important thing. so what are some of the things that people can do to make sure you know to start getting better as soon as possible they need to be uh, refrain from physical activity okay. initially so the old way of thinking was you put them in a dark room they do absolutely nothing for a week <laughs> that was <laughs> sounds the old good way to me the new research is showing that early return to activity and early return to learn helps to facilitate okay. their recovery. And when I say activity, I don't mean sports. I don't mean activities where they can hit their head in any way, shape, or form. I mean things like biking, stationary, mm -hmm. calisthenics, walking, stretching, things of that nature. Sometimes they'll do swimming. That they've found that both increase, both that quick return to activity and their quick return to learn, doing just a little bit, mm -hmm. In other words, no, anything that does not exacerbate their symptoms so they can okay. go up to their symptoms, start to worsen. Studies are starting stop. to show that it helps to shorten the duration of their symptoms. Okay. However, you sometimes within that first 24 to 48 hours, they need to relax a little bit. Some studies show that as long as you just have them back off a little bit, they're fine. Mm -hmm. Others show that they should rest to some degree, but it's no longer take away their electronics, take away their their phones and the television and their video games. It's just limiting things to where they don't have symptoms. It's really based on how they do. So if you are watching television and then you develop a headache, time to avoid, shut the TV off. Avoid okay. all your triggers because okay. what they've found is, especially in that adolescent and teen population, is pulling them away from their life is causing things like anxiety, depression issues, and as we all know, Anxiety, depression symptoms mm -hmm. are very similar symptoms to concussion. Those mm -hmm. vague, I don't feel right, I have headaches, mm -hmm. I'm nauseous. Mm -hmm. So they were, you can't necessarily tell which is mental health related and which is concussion related. So they're finding that if you get them back and in, back into their life, they don't suffer, suffer that isolation and that removal. Why do people, and maybe it's still a concern, sleeping after concussion? You know what I mean? Oh, you shouldn't let them sleep. You have to watch them sleep. Where did that come from? Where we are today with that in terms of after you know suffering, you know, uh, you know, a like concussion. waking the child up every yeah. hour. Or something. Yeah. Is that still the part? The, I don't know where it came from. Yeah, I, I, but, I've, but I've researched. I, I can't do. do? Okay, yeah. good, good. It came from when they used to uh, when it had to do with bleeding in the brain. Mm -hmm. So they were worried. They thought if they went to sleep. The, the myth is if they go to sleep, they're going to end up in a coma. Okay. But it came from people being um, told that if someone has a head injury, you need to wake them up to make sure that they don't have symptoms. Okay. It was not that they're going to slip into a coma, which most people think if you let them sleep, it's going to result in a bad brain injury. Yes. That piece, I don't know how we got there. Okay. But I know the, the recommendations from the physicians and the medical community was to wake them up once or twice. It wasn't every hour Just to initially. make sure, that, to make sure that they're not having the symptoms, that it's not evolving. <coughs> because when you're awake, it's easy to tell if your child okay. is confused. But now, really, the rest is important. So initially, it's okay to let them sleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they're not experiencing any worse signs and symptoms they're not getting you know feeling more nauseous getting a worse headache if those things happen you want to get into the emergency room mm -hmm. um, but if they you know come home and they just not themselves and they say you know I just don't feel right I have a headache you let them rest that first 24 to 48 hours like Kathy said very important rest them as much as possible you know allow them to recover as we know yeah, they're not rest, babies like don't right. let them just yeah. rest is is really our body's natural way to recover and heal itself so you know yep. let's take full advantage of that so red flags after an injury, like excruciating headaches, a really like escalating headache, nausea, vomiting, market kind of emotional, like you know changes, you know bring them in to get checked out, right to the ER and, 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 and yeah, yeah, trouble remembering. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it's really interesting because we have very um, very defined parameters on return to play. Do this first. If there's no increase in symptoms, move to the next step. If there's no increase, do the next one. Um, and once you get through all five steps mm -hmm. and you're, you're free, then you're able to go back to a practice or a game to go back. 
but we don't have that same type of a thing for a return to learn. Not as specific. You know, there's a lot of thoughts and ideas out there. Mm -hmm. Like Kathy said, they've changed a little bit now. Let them do a few of the things that at first were taboo, you know, not working on the computer or not doing any schoolwork. Um, but now they're saying that a little bit of that challenge to the brain is actually good for helping it to speed okay. up the recovery. Great. And sleeping definitely helps them recover. The other thing I just want to add too is nutrition and hydration. Okay. A lot of people forget that piece that for, especially with adolescents, they're growing, their cells are multiplying, they need nutrition. When you have a concussion, they don't feel like eating a lot of times or drinking. But it's very important that they do maintain proper nutrition and proper hydration because as we know, water, our bodies are predominantly water when mm -hmm. you think about it. And you need that to help your cells heal. Mm -hmm. And you need the fuel to help your body heal itself also. We see that so. in clinic a lot. It becomes like a chicken of the egg type process. Like I don't feel well, I'm nauseous. I th you know what I mean? And then I'm, then I'm not eating and drinking. And then the eating and drinking becomes why you're feeling nauseous. And, and it just Absolutely. it can be like your sodium gets depleted, your electrolytes get out of whack. And so you just, even though you don't feel like you got to just you know, be able to push the, you know, push the food and liquids. Absolutely. Yep. So, you know, kind of going through the steps to returning to play and if you're kind of knocking them off and progressing and returning to, to learning, that's great. Um, when, when do we... Like what? What time period do you tell people to kind of? When do you start to get a little bit concerned about um, maybe something like a post-concussive symptom, or things just aren't getting all the way better? They're saying now most of the experts, if you read, if concussion symptoms are worsening or lasting longer than three to four weeks, is three what to they four say. Weeks, okay. They they're not using post-concussion syndrome nearly as much. Okay. You don't see that. You see prolonged symptoms. You're just not seeing that actual phrase nearly as mm -hmm. much as you did. Mm -hmm. Some will say it's not until you hit that three-month mark that yeah. they don't get re really okay. concerned. Okay. The tough part is, is it's trying to figure out why the symptoms are lasting. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, and I've probably had a hand in dealing with probably five or 600 concussions anyways, if sure, not more, yeah. over my 30 years as an athletic trainer, there's usually something that is causing them. They're doing too much work. Okay. They're, they're running around when they shouldn't be. Things so it's not it's not adhering to the, the to that kind of yeah. Yeah. in a lot yeah. of cases they're basically trying to push through a lot of times it's your overachievers they're okay. terrified of getting even a day behind in school so they're doing full cognitive activity from day one mm. and it just you know it multiplies and then what starts happening is kids start they they catastrophize they think oh my god I'm going to get symptoms if I do work if I do more work this is going to happen, mm -hmm. and so it kind of takes a life of its own on. Okay. So it's trying to identify that. If there's no identified, if it's just worsening, they're behaving, they're, they're staying calm, they're exercising a little bit, they're doing what they can to return to learn as far as that mm -hmm. cognitive activity, keeping it below what exacerbates their symptoms, then that's when they say it might be worth having them see a concussion specialist. Okay. And sometimes what they'll do is, sometimes they'll do medicine for sleep, they might do supplements for sleeping, things of that nature. They don't do a lot different they just know how to use some of the medications to help to maybe help them. heal a little yeah it's, a lot yeah. of times it's to get them sleep gotcha. because then a lot of times yeah. their sleep is significantly disrupted mm -hmm. so they can't heal because they just can't get into that rest rest. Sleep. yeah and they okay. can't rest they just it's too it they're agitated yeah yeah absolutely so beyond about four weeks, you know, between four weeks and three months, if things are kind of, if you're doing everything, maybe you're, you're supposed to be not getting better, that would be the time to think about a concussion specialist. Yes. Okay. Most will okay. go, most primary cares I find now will go three or four weeks yeah. and send them off. And then at that three month mark is when even the specialist will start saying, okay, we've got some other issues now. We just need to look to see if we can figure out why they're under other underlying issues. For example, uh, those with ADHD, learning disabilities heal slower histories of anxiety and any type of mental illness, they heal much slower. So even maybe things that aren't, weren't recognized in the pre-concussion period that come out yeah. after. So that's yeah. where your colleague, Dr. Dorn, um, who's a, a, he's a neuropsychologist, neuropsychologist, yeah. neuropsychologist um, that, that's where he would put kind Be of... very helpful yeah. in doing the testing yeah. and yeah. trying to figure okay. out some of those other okay. things. Okay, so, so to try to kind of separate the concussion and the mental health. Yeah, and the key is, as they, those symptoms last, especially in adolescence, what we have to remember is adolescents and even kids to some degree, their life and their identity is a lot of times around what they do or mm -hmm. what they play. Mm -hmm. So when you remove them from their life, a lot of times it may actually be 
that they do not have, it's not concussion symptoms, it's depression symptoms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The other, yeah. you know, and the other thing to think about too is the symptoms are also, sometimes if you have cervical issues from the concussions, especially if it's a whiplash, they may need some type of rehabilitation. They might need vestibular rehab if their problem is with just dizziness, let's say. Right. If they're right. having trouble tracking, they get dizzy. So there are other things, even within that three-week period, that you can get them into. Right. If you notice if there's visual issues, they may need to see a So that's, com that's something common that I see, too, is like, almost like a vertigo that happens yes. from the concussion. And it's not, it's, it's classic vertigo, you know, head dizzy, the yeah. room spinning with head movement, and then it gets better when you stop. And that's one of the treatments right. that you can... You it's know, treating something else besides the concussion. It's incredibly helpful vestibular mm -hmm. therapy they're finding, and even some they're doing some ocular therapy. Neuro ophthalmologists and some other okay. professionals are doing some exercises for those who are having difficulty tracking and things like that. Do do people generally recommend an eye exam for any kind of visual changes or, or dizziness? I mean, how often does that come into to play? I think if there are visual changes mm -hmm. that aren't getting better or worse, then yes, okay. absolutely, an eye yeah. exam would be recommended. Um, you know, sometimes there might have been an underlying eye problem that never really was identified yeah. and the whatever caused that concussion magnified those okay. symptoms and now it's the visual disturbances that are causing the headaches and keeping, mm -hmm. you know, those things happening. It's no longer a concussion, it's all related to the visual disturbances so that's why an eye exam can become very important, okay. you know, if those things are not going away and they continue to linger. Okay. And I'm not sure they're done enough. It's quite frequently. Yeah. Yeah. They think the dizziness is truly vestibular. They don't, sometimes the providers don't appreciate that it could be mm -hmm. related to visual, yeah. the inability to converge. Okay. And then there's also a risk of re re repetitive concussions, right? Like the, the more times so, you so why suffer do we care? Yeah, a why concussion, do we care? Yeah. <laughs> the more serious it can become. Is that, is that true? It depends how you're looking at that. They, there are some studies out there, some of them are older, that say once you're above three concussions, there is some evidence that says later on in life they suffer some cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. Others say there really isn't as long as they've healed. In other words, they have their symptoms, the symptoms are completely resolved, they have no issues, they get back to it, and they have no problems. Okay. But they do say once you've had one, it's easier to sustain a second one, and they're not sure why Boston Children Physician was just talking about that. They're still not exactly sure what it is that makes them more prone to a second concussion. Does it take longer to recover each time you have a concussion? Like if you have the first one and you get better, maybe in a couple of weeks, then you suffer a second one. Does it take you longer to get back in your experience? Not, oh, I'm sorry. No, I think, I think that really depends on the length of time between. Mm -hmm. if, if like you have one, and it takes a couple of weeks to get better, and then a year later you have another one, you might be better in two days. But if you have one, it takes you a couple of weeks to get better, and two or three months later you get another one, I think that then tends to, but I think part of it also is you had one so recently that the second one kind of wakes you up to like, so you may just be a little, little sensitive, yeah, a little yeah, sensitive yeah, yeah. and say, oh, you know what, I don't want to get another one, or I don't want this to last any longer, mm -hmm. so you know you just kind of are a little safer about what you're doing and returning. So it may not be that the symptoms are there as much, but you're a little bit more cautious about how you care for it and how you treat for it. Gotcha. Okay, and great. if they are worsening, that's when they start looking and saying, okay, they've had two concussions. The first one was not too bad. The second one was worse. The third one was even worse. And they, uh, what they look at a lot of times is what's causing them. So they become concerned if, let's say, your first one was a car accident, your second one was a football hit, mm -hmm. your third one, you bumped your head on a cabinet just kind of walking by, your fourth one, you just tried to get your head out of the way. Then they start saying, okay, they're happening easier and easier. That's when they become more concerned okay. rather than just the number. Gotcha. So what sports do you, is any sport safe? <laughs> Concussions. Yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> but I mean, we all have to life be isn't safe. Life isn't safe. Yeah. We're yeah, not from concussions. Safe, yeah. I mean, yeah. you can get it in any sport that involves any type of contact to the body, mm -hmm. to, to another object. Um, you know, it basically, you know, there's a chance of getting concussion pretty much in anything that you do, from riding a bike or right. skateboard to playing soccer or football. I think I've actually concussed myself while swimming into the end of the pool. So Happens that is <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, quite a yeah. flip turn <laughs> now. Didn't huh? Not an Olympian. No. Nope. I yeah. think no. one of the things we need to remember though is sports brings so many good things and good qualities and teaches kids so many 
very valuable life lessons that we can't be terrified. I know I lecture all over the place on concussions and people look at me and say, you know, would you, does it worry you, does it scare you? When people are engaging in very unsafe behaviors and they're not trying to decrease the risk, yes. But we have to remember there are so many good things so we can't let that be the terrifying right. us and say our kids need to be wrapped up in bubble wrap and never go out. Yeah. Because the one good thing every expert you hear will tell you 99% of concussions if they are managed correctly get better. Get better. Yeah. So that's so important. So that's to hear. that's yeah. the important thing yep. to hear and think about, you know, you have to weigh the contact sports with the non-contact sports based on your child, what the philosophy, who's going to coach them, mm -hmm. what type of kid they are whether you can trust them to tell you if they have symptoms or mm -hmm. not. There's a whole slew of things that you need to look at when you're doing that, but it definitely shouldn't be something that parents are terrified and keep their kids out of sports in no. particular. Yeah. Now, I think as a parent, you need to be educated yourself yeah. about what it is. Absolutely. But you also want to find out if I'm, I have a son or a daughter that's going to play youth soccer or youth football, okay, have those coaches attended a concussion mm -hmm. uh, training program? Mm -hmm. Are they able to be aware of what's going on do they know if something happens to pull that kid out and not let him go back into the game you know those are all important aspects yeah. because if that's the case and they've done that then they're in a good safe environment you know go to a practice watch what they're doing you know are they making kids run headlong into each other banging heads together you know well that's not such a good thing to be happening yeah you know day in and day out so those are the types of things as a parent you need to you know watch out for and and advocate for your child mm -hmm. and you know if to have a talk with that coach or an administrator of that program and say, you know, I have some concerns. concerns. About this. Yeah. And if it happens to be football, you know, you want to be watching and make sure that they're not hitting with their heads. If you have well, go watch a son or daughter's football practice and everyone's hitting with their heads and the coach never takes them aside and explains to them you shouldn't be hitting with mm -hmm. your head, you need to keep your head up things of that nature, I personally would be a little concerned. Okay. Because what you want is the proper technique. From now, an not, early age, too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Not every child is going to hit correctly every time, mm -hmm. but what you want to see is that coaching, that the technique needs to be there. But if you're a parent who has never played football, you right. also need to educate yourself on what is the proper technique. Yeah. Easiest thing I tell everyone, head up. If they need to have their head up, they should never duck their head, A, for neck injuries also, yeah. but for concussions, and B, if their head is up, they can help to avoid that head trauma a little bit, mm -hmm. and you not becoming a human missile. Right. I mean, so, just look at the right. changes in college and uh, football and professional football, you know, the rules they've implemented, the targeting rules, and, you know, they're doing everything they can. It still happens, mm -hmm. uh, and occasionally it's unavoidable, mm -hmm. but for the most part, they're helping to eliminate a lot of those types of things that cause those types of concussions that were very severe. Right. right. Reinforce good behaviors is what you want to see the coaches mm -hmm. doing, good technique. So what are some of the things on the um, state level that are coming down? Is there legislation in terms of um, kind of standardizing anything? Is there, or is it more just your kind of professional input for? No, the legislation is there. There are already okay. regulations in place, in place. That, that basically govern, um, again, particularly uh, for the MIA member high schools, because that's kind of how it was uh, set up. But it's really good guidelines for any school so or, or youth organization to follow. Um, you know, that really states, you know, if there's uh, any suspicion of concussion at all, they don't, you take them out of play, they don't play, you know, they're done for the day until you have a chance to do a better assessment and find out what's going on. Um, so, those so that's are essentially non-negotiable. Yeah, it really of, yeah. is non-negotiable. Yeah, yeah. If there's a suspected concussion of any type, you know, they really should not be returning to play um, until a healthcare professional can really... Um, rule out mm -hmm. what's going on. And the signs and symptoms are going to be the primary thing to help you rule right. that out initially. Um, you know, the, there are some things trying to kind of standardize or best practice um, some of the reporting and some of the forms that go to the, to mm -hmm. the providers that come back to the schools to try and make those uh, a little easier, a little simpler for everybody to understand. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a, it, it's never going to really end. It's going to be an evolving process. As more research is done, as more studies right. come out, I mean, just in the, the past eight years, from where we started to where we are now, there's been so many different changes in, in how they look at things and, and what they're regulating and, and, you know, how they want to control, um, you know, exactly what happens to the individual. Right, right, right. There are multiple bills every legislative, every legislative season. There are multiple bills introduced having to do with neurocognitive testing, making that mandatory, 
they are trying to expand the law. Okay. The lead, people have put bills forth saying that it should include all schools. Oh, okay. Some so not just the so the MIA, not just MIA is the governing they want body. It all private okay, so schools. it would be private schools as well. Yep. One of the other things you're starting to see because we do not have any laws regarding youth sports is a lot of them want youth sports included, included also. Great. But the the enormity of that in trying to enforce it seems to be a little frightening to the legislature <laughs> yeah. because yeah. enacting something that you can enforce right. is tougher. But what you are starting to see is local communities enforcing their own regulations. For example, I want to say it's Fall River just mm -hmm. recently passed that any organization utilizing school or city-owned fields have yeah. to, their coaches have to have concussion have education. Have the training, okay. And, Great. Yep, and in some cases they go as far, Brookline I think goes as far as parents also have to have it, just like the state law regarding high schools. Newton does, there's wow. communities popping up all over the place, but I'm almost positive last year Fall River enacted something similar, so which I was very impressed with. Movements happening. To, yeah, and it's just, yeah. it's basically, it's not around restricting anything it's just around making the education making everyone mm -hmm. aware of what concussion is and educating everyone so that we know when a concussion occurs right. that we can keep them safe because we all still worry about especially myself being in a high school setting you worry about that second impact syndrome you know right. that kid who goes back on Too the field yeah. with a concussion yeah. sy with current concussion symptoms okay. who ends up with a brain issue and brain edema so what's the what's con the concern? We can talk a little bit more again. Like, why do we care so much about you know making sure that all of those symptoms are gone before people return? So that's a, it's a second impact. Second impact yeah, syndrome, syndrome, which is it doesn't happen all that often, okay. but it does happen, um, and that's when somebody returns to activity too soon. Mm -hmm. Usually, they are still symptomatic, although they may say that they weren't say that or, they weren't or, right, yeah, right, and they didn't right. have any symptoms but they want to get back to play so bad that they are able to kind of dupe the system um, and they get back in and they sustain another concussion which actually causes some structural damage okay. as well okay. um, and can lead to various types of brain serious, abnormalities right. very very serious you know from stroke like symptoms mm -hmm. to paralysis to um, cognitive deficits that will never return so right. Those are, the, those are the really scary things. And I think initially that was always the thing. We want to avoid second impacts. In right. or we don't want somebody to die from this. Right. But as we've learned more and, and been educated more, it's far more than that. Than that. You know, we want to be safe so that a, a child is able to develop normally. I, I think Kathy and I spoke last time about the developing brain of a child. Um, the reason why it's so important is, you know, any other injury to a child, a broken bone, a cut, a scrape, they heal quickly, right? Their mm -hmm. bodies are growing. The brain is just the opposite because the brain is using up so much energy, energy to yeah. develop and yeah. to, that it, it doesn't heal quickly. It heals much, much slower than an, an adult, adult brain right? that gets a type of concussion, right. which, you know, they may have symptoms for a couple of days and then they kind of go away and, mm -hmm. and they're fine. Um, so as the research has found and as more things have uh, been discovered, that's why the importance is not so much really about the second impact syndrome, which again is important, but it's really about managing the concussions to allow for somebody to develop cognitively without having any type of permanent deficit. Right. Right. And they've also shown the secondary thing also, is they've shown is that two concussions right away, one and then another, mm -hmm. it prolongs recovery considerably. Considerable. So in other words, that child who falls down, they hit their head in the basketball game, they get back up and keep playing because they never said anything, and it might happen in the same game, they get hit again. Or you have that child who hurts themselves, so let's say playing soccer, and then three days later, they hit their head again, and now instead of just having a mild headache, now they have all these neurological issues, mm -hmm. dizziness, severe headaches, nausea, so it tends to be worse and it seems to take longer take when longer they sustain to them okay. too close together. And then one of the other things is when someone is coming back, they've found that if you come back in the same season, if some, for those who suffer two concussions in the same season, it's usually within 10 days of returning from the first. Oh wow! Okay. They find out. Wow. So I wonder sometimes whether they are they just not, not completely. Yeah. yeah, you delayed a little bit. Not you were not agile, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. was it there were some symptoms they didn't notice were there, or mm -hmm. is it that truly it we're just that's our vulnerability cone of vulnerability, I guess you'd call it, of that yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like there's not enough evidence yet to say exactly why, but they know that is the case. How uh, reliable do you find uh, you know kind of high school kids in in 
you know, reporting their symptoms? Or, or, or is there enough kind of education as to why we care and want them to be symptom free? Um, I mean, it's hard to. I, I think. Hard to I think that's why the education is so, so important, important. For, now, the, for the student, for athlete. the student yeah. athlete, as well as for the parents. Right. I mean, as athletic trainers, when we're in a school, yeah, we may see a kid every day for a couple hours a day and get to know the, the child pretty mm -hmm. well. But the parent is really one that knows their child, so they're the one they're going to be most able to really identify things that are just different, just that they're not just the yeah. same. So it really is a collaborative and a team effort, mm -hmm. you know, between the mm -hmm. athletic trainer, the parents, the coaches, the teachers that have the kid in class every day. Um, they all have to kind of be on the same page and understand so the same thing. So fitting things. it all together can kind of get a complete yeah, picture. Yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. Yeah. Interesting. And if you're interested in the metrics, if you look on the DPH website, I think they still have it up there. Every two years, there's a school-based health survey that they have to do for the state. Mm -hmm. They started including concussions, I want to say 2010 or 12. Mm -hmm. And it's still slightly alarming. The number of kids, one of the questions on there is, have you sustained, have you had concussion symptoms after a blow to the head and not basically reported them, not reported them, reported them and abstained from athletic activity, continue to do everything. And it's still alarmingly high for me how many do not report their symptoms. Okay. Okay. So I think um, the tough thing is there's lots of people out there who have done it and they're just fine or they think they're just fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. I tell everybody. Or, or like when we were growing up and it was a, we, we didn't have such a high self monitor for it. So, yep, you know, you kind of just didn't feel good and it, we never really identified it as a concussion. Right. So not yeah. that it's happening more, we're just better at knowing what's happening. Of course you got a headache. Yeah. You got yeah. a headache. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. right. Like, what's wrong with you? Of course. Our threshold, I think, is also lowered. Yeah. yeah. You know, it used to be you had to be unconscious or confused. Now it's just having, you know, even one of those symptoms mm -hmm. a headache or nausea or dizziness. And I think it's warranted that the, the research is showing that if you look at some of the neuro neurocognitive, for example, impact is one of them. The reason I use that is that just tends to be where the most data is right now, and that's what we personally use in some of the schools around, that they're not back to complete cognitive normal or baseline, I guess you could say, sometimes seven to 10 days. But I, I've found just through my experience, their symptoms are gone sometimes in three or four days, but that okay. if they've had a baseline impact test on any type of a neurocognitive test and we redo that, it's funny how at that 10 day mark, if I test them, if they had symptoms for anything more than a day, if I test them at that four or five day mark, they don't, that seven day mark, it's back to it's baseline, bad. it's the oddest thing. Hmm. So, and they've found, they've demonstrated that studies that go back as far as the 70s on the brain and way brain chemistry works as seven to 10 days, seven to 14 days. So In they've been spot the on end. since yeah. the 70s wow. Wow. Well, on that. Good. Speaking of like other things that we used to maybe brush off, you hit your head, you know, no big, uh, um, heat injuries. I mean, just, you know, kind of closing, you know, the dog days of August are behind us, but it's been a very hot September. Athletes are out there, people are doing different things. You know, let's talk about, you know, heat injuries with athletes and recognizing them, you know, maybe in terms of preventing them as well and just, you know, kind of intervening early. Do, do you see a lot of this? Is this happening still? Uh, this August was probably, no, it was the worst by far. I mean, on record, it was the hottest August that we've had ever. Um, I think that, um, again, because we're better educated about heat illnesses, and there have been so many deaths, especially down south, mm -hmm. Texas, the southern states, related to heat illness, and there's much more information out there. I think uh, athletic trainers and coaches are much more aware of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, our athletic trainers for South Coast did a really good job of helping to educate their coaches and, and doing the things that are necessary when you have heat like that by altering practices, you know, either not practicing at all, changing practices to later in the day after the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the immense heat has passed. Um, you know, there were really a lot of concerns initially uh, when double sessions started for football and for these sports. It was about, right in the in the right thick right of, in it. The thick yeah. of yeah. it. And and you know, at first there was a little bit of pushback about what do you mean? You know, I used to practice in this all the time. Well, no, you didn't. You didn't have this. It's the first time we've ever had it this long. <laughs> yeah. So you can say that, but unless you came from down south somewhere, um, up here you didn't have that. So I think the really the most important thing is again education and understanding, um, but also just everybody being on the same page and communicating and, and understanding that there are very very inherent risks by pushing somebody physically 
through the intense heat like that, mm -hmm. the, the different types of uh, things that can happen are usually not very good. So keeping athletes healthy, so number one, just being aware of it and recognizing it, maybe changing practice schedules to cooler times a day. Hydration, Absolutely. you know, in terms Huge. of... Huge, yeah. hydrating, uh, removing equipment if it's an equipment intensive sport. The good thing is heat stroke is completely preventable. Okay. Um, it's knowing, not allowing those oh athletes gosh. or pushing those athletes, you know, that Maryland death that you read about that happened in May, actually I think it was June, that when they look he tried, it sounds like from the media reports that he tried to run through and was pushed through things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's when it's that hot out, it's letting that child rest, it's getting them into a cool place, but the biggest key in preventing heat stroke deaths themselves is if somebody is suffering from heat stroke, they need to be cooled down immediately and it needs to be rapid. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the time their body spends above 106 degrees or 105.5 that is, makes the difference between being alive or dead. And they've done some research that shows if they are rapidly cooled and they spend less than 30 minutes, I think it's 30 minutes above 106, they are much more likely to completely recover. Okay. So the key is if they're getting hot, if they're suffering things, you know, heat usually happens in a sequence, but it does not always. Starts with some heat cramps, you know, that give that kid with the abdominal cramps, the calf mm -hmm. cramps, and then maybe the hamstring cramps. Then they start being a little dizzy, a little nauseous, their heart is racing a little bit, they've got a headache. It does not always. Some skip right to heat stroke, but a lot of them do go sequentially. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start getting to the point where somebody is confused, they're staggering, mm -hmm. they're not making sense, that ever happens, you find ice and water to get them into, and you douse them in and you call ice tub and call <laughs> while you're doing that, yeah. wow. and get them as cold, cool as they can. You know, we use what we call, some people have cold tubs. Mm -hmm. We use even the taco method. It's you take a tarp, you'd lie the kid in the tarp if you had to, you'd mm -hmm. dump every bit of ice. I mean, I've used Kool-Aid and Gatorade to cool people Just off. Just to bring it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pour it in and hold it up, almost like you're making your own little pool, or you mm -hmm. wrap them up. Mm -hmm. in that but it's the, the key is the hydration and watching the temp as well as the humidity we had some as Joe was saying you know people saying it's never been this hot you know the temperatures dropped maybe into the 80s which to most people isn't that hot but when the humidity is 80 and 90 percent so it's the combination between the two mm -hmm. if parents are concerned or even coaches are mm -hmm. concerned there are some great References online, if you look up heat index, safe practice parameters, things of that nature, if you Google those, yeah. you can find a grid that literally puts the temperature, the humidity, and will tell you they should be doing nothing, they should be doing things with just no equipment, they can do moderate practice, and every hour they need you know, 20 minutes of rest and hydration and shade to unrestricted. So it's, there's some really good research resources out there. I think the Corey Stringer Institute has some too. That's great. For parents to help them. Okay. And hydrating with water, straight water, electrolytes and water, like what's the... What's the key the... thing really in hydration is, you know, if you start drinking after you get the signs and symptoms, it's too it's late. It's too late, okay. The hydration, you need to prehydrate, you know. Uh, if you know, and so when we're talking about the, the fall season, the start of sports, we know that not every kid has been out there all summer working out and conditioning and is ready to show up that mm -hmm. first day of practice. Mm -hmm. Ready in to top. go. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a large percentage of them that just got off the couch from the video games for that first day of practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and you can and, tell, and by those, the way, you yeah. can't fool them. <laughs> and those are the ones that really are at more risk mm -hmm. in those cases. But, um, you know, drinking that water the day before, the night before, you, you have to have a practice to get the, your, yeah. your hydration up. Um, you know, nutrition, another key point. You know, making sure that they're eating right so their bodies are, are nourished well enough to be able to handle it. The real key thing is is the observation, the observation of coaches, the athletic trainers, um, and and watching to, to notice when that kid, you know, if you're running sprints and you got one kid that's lagging behind and he starts to run a zigzag and, you know, he may not just be dogging it, you know, there could be some serious consequences and it's, you know, not pushing that kid through it and, and pulling them out, you know, and I've had coaches tell me, oh, well, if I do it for that one, I'm going to have to do it for, you know, for all of them. Well, you well, know, you may have to, that yeah. may be what you have to do on particular days, um, but you have to have some common sense and you really have to, you know, keen your observation skills up to really help to identify that. Like Kathy said, completely preventable. Because if you are watching what's going on, you're aware of what your climate is, mm -hmm. um, you're making those changes that are necessary to help to prevent those things, then you're probably never going to have yeah. to deal with it. But I can tell you as an athletic trainer, as a coach, 
Once you deal with it once, you're never going to want to deal with it again because it is frightening. Yeah. And life threatening. And life threatening. Yeah. Yes. And the, I, from speaking with our ten athletic trainers, I had a couple of conversations with them about the heat because we, you know, we talked about getting everything out to the athletic directors and the coaches. Several of them said this is probably the best year they've had for heat illnesses. They didn't have the sick kids because as of that much high. because the coaches were yeah. adhering and the, the athletic directors yeah. that education, but they were limiting the practices. They were moving a lot of them. were started going six to eight instead of in the you know the middle mm -hmm. of the day. Some mm -hmm. did go early in the morning. Mm -hmm. The kids were hydrating because everyone was telling them to hydrate. And the, as Joe said, the prehydrating, but it's the post hydration too. Right. What happens is, is I tell them. That it's not the one day of heat that gets us in trouble most of the time. It's day two, day three, and day four because, as you know, my, I always tell them you're a quart low, kind of like on oil. What happens <laughs> is you're here. You start low to begin with. Now you lose a couple of quarts. Now you lose a little bit more. So by day four, you haven't replenished nearly enough. So you're mm -hmm. starting well below where you should be in that dangerous area. Mm -hmm. You know, so we try to tell them that they need to go home and drink everything except for caffeinated beverages, juices, Gatorades, waters whatever they milk, anything that they can get in to help them hydrate, to replenish those fluids that they lost. And it, that's an ongoing challenge. Children don't drink enough and it's yeah. tough. They can't drink all day in school. Mm -hmm. So once they're back in school, it makes it even harder. Yeah. And then they're not feeling well and you want to drink even less. Oh, right. 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 Just put right. fluid in your stomach. Yeah. 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 So it's little, little sips frequently is what I tell them. Okay. That's great. Well, that's really important. And I think we've touched on a couple of really important topics for our student athletes and even just for everybody who yeah, you lives. Yeah, yeah. 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 Even just, people who work. Yeah, it's work. You, right. you're, you're doing yard yeah. work outside. Yeah. I mean, pacing yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. even people who are out doing construction and any type of physical job in the heat, it's very important. Yeah. They've usually learned the hard way. Right. They've ended up sick or but So they, it's the same tips, hydrating, staying out of, in the shade, rest as much as you can. Well, thank you very much for taking an hour out of your busy schedule. This is like prime athletic season. Thank you for um, educating the community on these type of, you know, kind of illnesses. I mean, it's fantastic success that this is the best season for kind of heat-related injuries and the work you do with, you know, educating um, people on concussions and the athletic training programs. We're lucky to have you guys. And, thank, uh, you thank you very much, and thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. We appreciate it. And that's it. We're all caught up. We had a couple shout outs here from, from Donna and Nicholas Anthony said that uh, way to go, Kathy, loving the athletic trainer representation. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And I think that kind of wraps it up for questions. Great. Stay healthy, South Coast. I had two blockages. I had to have a catheterization and told me that we needed to see a surgeon as soon as possible. Dr. G made me feel like I was his only person that he ever did surgery on. You don't have to go to Boston. You can come right here to South Coast and get the best treatment. I said to him, Dr. G, I guess I'm going to fall in love with you. He says, I know I'm going to touch your heart.